What's up, my millionaires, billionaires, trillionaires that's entering this crypto space? I welcome you to this channel. You are now that one percenter. You are that one percent that believed and held and invested into the blockchain currency and other digital assets family. You guys are all are going to have generational wealth. As you guys see, it was just $100 a token. Now it's $500 a token. And the next price that's coming up right now is $2,500 a token. It may be a lot more higher than what you see. As you see right here, if you really do read the white paper, it says all token purchases are required to be held for 90 days. The value of the GOPX token may increase above the smart contract with no limit. Like all investments, these figures should not be considered as guarantees. Family, you guys have invested. A lot of people who didn't invest, it's just, you know, they just didn't believe and, you know, didn't take risks. Understand that it. Risk is a scary word, but at the same time, are you really scared to invest for your future, to have generational wealth, or to live day by day, living by fiat, listening to your boss to get paid in fiat, and then let others become wealthy? You don't want that. Again, in the next five to 10 years, things are going to dramatically change. Your employers are going to start issuing out digital currencies as a form of payments. When you're going to the grocery stores, there are going to have options. You can use fiat, you can use a debit or credit card, or you can use cryptocurrency to purchase your groceries or food, family, even gasoline. So this is why it's very important why you are hodling. You see, even though any other asset will go up to a substantial price, the thing about it is it's too early. It's just too early to sell. I can see it, but not everybody is going to be able to see what I see. You have to see within your own eyes, with your own knowledge and wisdom that you have gained by researching different digital currencies. And now, you hold a blockchain currency, first of its kind, first ever made, family. You guys know they got this thing going with Belize. They have a lot of countries hopping into this blockchain currency, family. So if you guys are hot on GOPX, type down GOPX down below. Let me know you are hot. Now, if you guys already knew, GOPX already started this metaverse, and it's going to be major. But the thing about it is, look at this, South Korea to invest $177 million directly in metaverse platforms. Again, family, you hold digital currency, you hold blockchain currency. They are very valuable into this space. Why would just South Korea alone just put in $177 million directly in metaverse? Why? Because we are going to have to use our digital currencies or our blockchain currencies and use to buy or spend whatever we want inside of there and outside of the metaverse. So this is very major and this is pretty cool. You know, if for you guys who doesn't know, let me read into it. The government of South Korea has announced it will start investing in metaverse projects directly. More than $177 million will be invested to kickstart national jobs and companies in this field, according to the statements made by Lin Haiso, Minister of Science and Information and Communication Technologies. South Korea is one of the first countries to put funds into this field, family. And you guys know other countries is going to lead on as well. The investment is part of the new tech focus South Korea has included in its digital new deal, a set of guidelines that the government is following to push citizens to transition to a fully digital society. So this is what they're saying. It's going to depend on how different countries approach the legal side. With any new technology or disruptive ecosystem and new places to interact, there will be issues, challenges, and for sure, dangers. 
which they're going to have to say that. Uh, some things are happening in bits and pieces, but I believe this this does tell you that governments are starting to take this more seriously because it's a platform where people come together. Anything which makes people come together, it makes governments interested. And they've been interested. They've been buying into digital assets like crazy. Once they hear about uh, GOPX, they're going to be buying in like crazy, family. Now, in other news, JP Morgan, CEO Jamie Dimon, warns of incoming economic hurricane says you better brace yourself and, I, and everybody should already know we're going to deal with the bear market but at the end of the day i don't like calling it the bear market it's a black friday sale a lot of you guys who have been following me since day one you guys know when the market is red that's when we buy up the market we buy fear we don't scream fear we don't you know what i'm saying we don't do none of that we buy it we buy it and when it starts turning green and everybody is in greed, nah, we hold our horses and we hold. You could choose to sell, but we'll let the other people who come into the space and buy in at that. We know better. We do not buy at no high prices. That's just ridiculous. Anytime it's in the green, we definitely would not buy. So the CEO of JP Morgan and Chase, Jamie Dimon, warned about an incoming economic hurricane Wednesday at a financial conference sponsored by Alliance Bernstein Holdings. It's a hurricane, Diamond exclaimed, while noting that right now it's kind of sunny, things are doing fine, everyone thinks the Fed can handle it, the J.P. Morgan executive stressed. That hurricane is right out, right out there down the road coming our way. We just don't know if it's a minor one or a superstorm, Sandy. You better brace yourself. And again, even if the markets like plummet, even if Bitcoin touches $3,000, man, I'm scooping up as much money as I can to buy me a couple Bitcoins and buy all these other digital assets that has real use case and utility. I am buying it. So I like to see this type of stuff. Most of you guys do not like to see this stuff. But again, family, we're still so early. That's what you guys have to understand. Don't be like riding off a of hopium just, oh, you know, we're going to become a millionaire in the next year or this year. No, no, we don't know. No one knows. But what I do know and what I can tell you is in the next couple of years, maybe five or 10 years, you will be a multi-billionaire. See, I believe in the next three or four years, you might, you'll already become a millionaire. Honestly, if you invested into the right digital assets, if you invested into a blockchain currency, we've never had QT like this. So you're looking at something you could be writing history books on for 50 years, 50 years. And things when they say stuff like that, it's just, you know, it's kind of like saying something major is going to happen. Whenever the feds, whenever the government start talking crazy, oh, you know, cryptocurrency is a risk, it's a scam, you shouldn't invest into it. Because they know that in 2017, multi-millionaires and billionaires was created. This is the reason why we have a Coinbase. This is the reason why we have a Binance US. It's a reason why we have an FTX and Gemini and so on. Those exchanges all came from people like me and you who invested into early and became billionaires and started their own exchanges, family. So you got to remember that. So this is what they're saying. He explained that central banks don't have a choice because they're too much liquidity in the system. They have to remove some of the liquidity to stop the speculation, reduce home prices and stuff like that. Demon is also worried about the Russia-Ukraine war and its impact on commodities, including food and fuel. He warned that oil could potentially hit 150 to 175 a barrel. And this is the thing. If gas is going to go incredibly high, $10 a gallon, I know you guys said, I reviewed that. Don't you say that, Crypto Brown. Don't you talk about no darn $10 a gallon, but it's okay. I want, I, I want, $10 a gallon prices because why if everything else is going up 
What makes you think cryptocurrency and blockchain currency won't go up as well? You really have to think think outside of the box. They're doing everything in front of your faces. They're making everything so high because they're making you scared to even invest. They want to pull your card and say, do you have enough money to invest into this when gas prices are high? You probably work 20 miles from where you live. Your child may go to school 20 miles of where you live. How are you going to uh, afford food, housing, everything else? They're trying to play mind games and pressure you to not invest. I would never let them play me like that. We're not taking the proper actions to protect Europe from what's going to happen to oil in the short run. Family, we know what's going to happen. We know that we're all going to become multimillionaires, billionaires, and trillionaires. It's just a matter of how long do you want to hold? How much how, how how much is it like are you going to try to invest into your future, taking risk? And what I mean by risk, not risking your house mortgage or refinance your home to invest in cryptocurrency, not taking out your bills. I'm talking about risking of taking $20, $30 out of your uh, savings and be like, you know what? Instead of me going out to eat or whatever, I'm putting into cryptocurrency. You don't always need thousands of dollars. You don't always need to spend $500. It's what you can afford. It's basically what you can afford, family. And yet again, if you guys are not holding Yeti, you can buy Yeti coin on Coinbase Wallet. Coinbase wallet. It's at 1262, up 36%, family. Again, they have the move to earn app so you can say fit say fit fitness. Excuse me. But instead of having your child, your you know, your your partner get up to be able to work out, you're earning passive income. Who doesn't want to earn passive income by working out and earning Yeti coin? Right now, if you just spend 40, 50 bucks on Yeti coin, you can get you a couple billion. A couple billion, but at the same same time, is I'm not gonna regret it because I'm stuffing my bags into real utility. Most people are scared to invest into other digital assets because they don't do their research. But as again, is I put my name on these digital assets that I do invest in. You guys know it. You guys know I hold GOPX. You guys know I hold Yeti Coin. You definitely know I hold XRP and so on. All right. Now, as you guys see, Ripple XRP steady even as 1 billion tokens leave escrow, and here's why. Again, family, if you guys are not holding XRP, I don't know what you guys are doing. The prices are very low. It can get lower, but don't quote me on that, but I'm still holding. And I don't want you guys to be left out on XRP. So, XRP total supply stands at 48.34 billion. The blockchain company released 1 billion XRP in two different transactions for its escrow wallet. According to WellAlert, $423 million worth of tokens has been unlocked from escrow at Ripple Escrow Wallet. The XRP token is trading at an average of 41 cents. Okay, family? Ripple has locked 55 billion XRP tokens, which man makes 55% of its total supply in this series of escrows. This action was taken in order to provide additional predictability to the token supply. The firm mentioned that these escrows are on the ledger itself. The same ledger mechanics are designed to control the release of XRP. And I know a lot of you guys are saying like, well, you know, XRP, I heard about it for a long time and it just didn't do nothing. Did you guys know XRP and XLM has not had its bull run yet? Out of all digital assets, XRP and XLM has not had their bull run. Like, there are sleeping giants. Definitely. According to WellAlert, over $73 million worth of XRP tokens were bought in multiple transactions in the last 24 hours. In three different transactions, over $175 million were from multiple exchanges. Meanwhile, 120 million XRP, approximately worth 50.1 million, were transferred from some unknown well whale wallet to another. So I'm gonna play you guys a little quick clip and I'm gonna come right back after. 
Abhijit Dhanu. I'm co-founder and CEO. The company has set up back in 2014 uh, with a clear vision of trying to build a global payment infrastructure which connects uh, banks, financial institutions. If you look at our customer base, uh, we actually cover a wider base uh, than majority of the payment service providers. So about 60% of our business is financial institutions. So financial institutions includes banks, uh, payment processors, other payment services providers, money services business, etc. Then the 40% of our business is also includes uh, people like such as marketplaces, travel tech companies, hotel booking sites, etc. So the key aspect what we try to solve for them is two aspects of payments: uh, is how to send money fast as possible and at the lowest possible cost. Uh, fast forward 2019, we are now. accessible in about 35 countries we send payments to about 55 countries i think uh, ripple net actually really helps us globalize much faster i think a great example is one of the customers which we've got say btech for example btech is a customer in brazil uh, who uses us to process payments into quite a few markets across the globe we would have never met btech if it was not for ripple net right because uh, we were actually solving a problem but we did not have a sales force in uh, latin america acquiring clients for us so that was actually done by ripple net so i think what uh, ripple net really helps us do is go to markets which we are not present help us really articulate a solution etc much better than what we could do so i think uh, ripple net is a very strong partnership where we are seeing scaling happening much faster on ripple net than actually acquiring customers directly If you are a bank uh, and if your son calls you up at midnight, uh, say Singapore time, and says that hey, I'm in trouble and I need some money immediately, uh, the only way for you is to go and send cash today, right? So that means you need to go out of your house, go and find a cash location, give cash, call your son, give him a number. He goes to a cash out location, takes the number and gets the cash out. But if you need it immediately through a bank, it's not possible. So what we've been working with banks to make this payment system real time. So for example, if your kid calls you up and says that hey, I need money immediately, you just go onto your mobile app, three clicks, send, and within few minutes the money is already in his bank account. And that's a great uh, service point for a bank. It enables them to acquire more customers, and that's what banks want, right? They want to acquire more customers, grow their business, and by connecting to Ripple Net, it actually definitely is a strong point for them uh, to kind of being able to offer a service like this. because being a technology driven company we don't need that many people so across the globe we are about 200 people today companies of our scale and size are thousands in uh, so uh, say a parallel competitor would have about 1100 people we don't need that many people so our focus is on technology machine learning partnerships with uh, you know ripple net for example help us drive our cost even down further so as you guys see ripple is the fastest the fastest digital currency that was ever created Just like what he said, if your son is in Saudi Arabia and he needed, he was in trouble and he needed some money. You're not going to Western Union. You're not doing money ground. He ain't doing cash app. You're doing XRP. Give him ten thousand dollars in XRP, transfer to him in seconds, anywhere in the world. So I'm gonna read this for you guys right quick. One four agreements are established to work together in the new financial system and create alliances in all areas of banking, multinational, and commercial companies. Two market clarity is planned behind the closed doors, and the agreement to protect only XRP is created. SEC lawsuit until SWIFT is updated and changes its methods and data transfer to a new standard. Delay case until utility. By then, it is already known that XRP will be the new world standard. New world standard, family. Three, the offline XRPL ledger network is tested in Antarctica, in addition to ignition and data unification protocols for institutions, companies, banks, and governments. Christine Lagarde, which you guys know her, she is a elite. The servers are working perfectly. Everything is ready. The scroll is delivered, and that's top secret. That was in 2021. Number four, the new payment standard is implemented in several economic sectors and mainly in central banks. The first CBDCs, which is called central bank digital currencies, interconnected to a neutral global liquidity bridge, XRP ledger, begin to be tested. David supervises the extension of the network, and if you guys don't know who David, David is David Swartz, chief officer. For the first time, private accounting books are joined with public ones. Let's flip the switch, baby. 
XRP gets legal clarity and all the money flows into it. The price shoots up ahead of the news. Ahead of the news. The gold standard is back. XRP was always the chosen one in the shadows. The crypto world freaks out seeing Bitcoin and Ethereum lose their throne to the new standard. The price remains stable and gradually increases year by year. In the new list, Flare is ranked number two and XLM is ranked number three from 2022 to 2025. So why are there riddles? There have privileged information, so they must cover their tracks to avoid being sued for violating confidentiality agreements. Remember that DS, he likes to play chess. Family. That's my boy, Coin, Coin Kid. Family, like, I hope you guys are bullish the way I am. I hope you guys are understanding what you guys hold. Understanding the future is about to come that you are going to have generational wealth. I'm going to play this clip with Brad Garlandhouse, and he's telling you guys what's happening. There's uh, like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger who've made derogatory comments, but not that long ago, Jamie Dimon, someone who said they thought Bitcoin was a, a fraud and has subsequently come around and realized that, in my judgment, this is an industry that is not going away. It's valued today at about $1.2, $1.3 trillion. But I do think, and I've spoken to Christine Lagarde personally, and I think we, we need to stop measuring it just by what's going on with the overall value and how are these assets being used to solve real world problems. And I think time and time again, we're seeing more and more real use cases solving real scaled problems where blockchain technologies can reduce friction measured by cost and speed in a way that I think improves the overall economy. Does the fact that um, these 19,000 uh, cryptocurrencies have been largely used as speculative assets do damage to the underlying case that you're arguing for? I think absolutely yes. I, and it's frustrating. You know, I said when there were about 2,000, so as you said correctly, there's about 19,000 today. When there were about 2,000, I got some heat from the crypto market by saying that something like 99% of them I thought would go to zero. And that wasn't a popular statement suggesting that only 20 would be around. Well, now you have 19,000. You know, my, my prediction, at least for now, has been moved the wrong direction. But, you know, there are some tokens out there that I think are focused on solving a problem. And those are ones that I can see being used in the future. And we could give a number of different examples. Some of them are present here in Davos. Uh, but there's also ones that I look at, I hear the description, and I don't get it. Uh, and I think there is risk, as Christine Lagarde commented. They're, they're, they are speculative. They are risky. But that doesn't mean there isn't real opportunity. Right. I find this conversation refreshing. We've spoken to so many crypto experts out there who know nothing about this and who just want the gamification of it. They just want to encourage people into various Ponzi schemes. I, I hear what you're saying. We, we're great fans of what blockchain technology can do. But, but just to categorically say, you think most of these products are just going to disappear and investors are going to lose their money over the coming years? I think there is a high risk that, well, certainly when you say most, more, meaning more than 50%, I think there's a high risk that most of these fears. How many fiat yeah. currencies in the world are there? About 180? Yeah. yeah. I, look, there is clearly examples where these can be used. What Ripple is doing with our digital asset that we use in our technology stack called XRP mm. is solving a cross-border payments problem. And that cross-border payments problem we all have experienced when you're moving money cross borders, it is slow and it is typically expensive. There's no reason we can't use these technologies to solve that problem. I hear you. And do you know what? I think more regulation, better than we can all know what we're trading with. Why don't you want more regulation on XRP? Why are you in a big fight with SEC's Gary Gensler that's just going on and on? What is So as what you heard, what Brad Garlinghouse said, a lot of these digital assets that you may hear about will not be around in the next couple of years. They're going to go to zero. They're going to go to zero. That's why I tell you guys, you have to learn what you invest in. What is the utilities? What is the real world use case? What problems can it solve? Because if it's not solving nothing, you guys are holding nothing. So please, you guys know you guys have GOPX, a blockchain currency. You guys know you have XRP, XLM, Yeti, Coin, Dogalon, and so on, family. Don't let these other YouTubers that think that they know what they're talking about just tell you what they think, okay? You have to really use your common sense and pay attention to the actual facts, to the actual news that's really coming out and de deciphering it.
Do you understand what I'm saying, family? You can't be punked out. Don't let no uh Mark uh don't let what's his name? Don't let no Warren Buffett punk you out. Don't let Bill Gates punk you out. Definitely don't let the feds punk you out and cheat you out of your generational wealth, family. Again, you see this dude right here. Crypto goes shopping for a regulator. It can push around. Like, these real assets, these real digital currencies, they want regulation. They want these nonsense cryptocurrencies to be trash. So if you hold $10,000 worth of another asset that has no use cases, no real utility, that $10,000 is going to the drain and you're never seeing it again. I'm just telling you guys the facts. So I'm going to play this little video right here. But again, if you just now are a new subscriber, hit that like button. Subscribe. Let's get my videos in the algorithm. We got other YouTubers out there. You know what I'm saying? They like to throw, you know what I'm saying? They just want to do the clip bait. But I'm actually giving you guys this news. And I want to teach you guys to enhance your mind of knowing this finance. You guys are investing into the new asset class of wealth. But to go into Bitcoin, which is the future, I'm going to talk about the next 10 years. And, and surprisingly, one of the reasons I created the Rich Dad Company was because of Gresham's Law. You know, the bad money chases out good money, or good money goes into hiding. I never saw Bitcoin. And now I'm going, holy moly, what's going to happen next, you know? So what do you think is going to happen next, Mr. Breedlove? Yeah, you know, no one saw Bitcoin coming. No one had any expectation of gold could be disrupted um, or even have a competitor for that matter. So it's very interesting times we live in. But I think the U.S. in 2021 is on equivalent monetary footing to France in 1791. Okay. And to put a few numbers to this, so after expanding, France had been expanding its money supply roughly 300% in the years leading up to 1791. They then settled into an annual expansion of 18% per year in 1792. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through the history of France and I'll tie it back to the U.S. So 1792, France is expanding 18% a year. They double their money supply expansion again to 35% in 1794. Again, the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation. The more money they printed, the more money they had to print to keep the, the thing going. Then in 1795, France quadrupled their money supply expansion rate to 145% per year. And finally, in 1796, the printing press, where they're actually creating the currency, the, the assignments, was publicly broken and burned so they <laughs> they would not print anymore. And the currency had fallen to zero, basically. And so in that six-year period, 1790 to 1796, France expanded its money supply 100x and fully depreciated its currency. So... If we use that as kind of a framing, and that there's many historical examples, but I just picked one um, that, that uh, conveys the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation to tie that to the U.S. In the U.S. today, from 2001 to 2020, we've expanded our money supply roughly 250%, so just a little bit less than France did. And recently, in 2020, we've started expanding our money supply at about 18% per year. Now, that's a conservative estimate. Uh, the actual numbers are roughly 25%, but I'm just going to go with 18 uh, to be conservative. So we're tracking right on the numbers. Tracking right on the numbers. And so if we, use, if we again, looking at the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation, I would predict here 2024, we will be forced to double that issuance rate again. So from 18% to 35%. And as you alluded to earlier, Biden is already talking about five and ten trillion dollar stimulus packages. That would be well in excess of thirty five percent expansion. Um, so, I think that will happen again. And then by the year twenty thirty, I would expect that we have to quadruple that rate again, uh, reaching a monetary expansion rate in the U.S. of one hundred forty five percent annually. By that time, so if that if those rates hold uh, between now and twenty thirty where we increase to 35% in 2024 and 145% in 2030, the total U.S. M2 money supply will have expanded 
from today it's around 20 trillion it will expand 25x to 500 trillion dollars that's what I think is going to happen in the next decade in the U.S. money supply. And then if we look abroad, I think what you're going to have is just a wave of smaller currency collapses, smaller sovereigns with weaker currencies. They will just be collapsing stronger currencies like the dollar, um, like, like the, the Chinese yuan as well. And by the end of this decade, I would expect that the, the total purchasing power of the dollar Globally today is about it represents about twenty percent. So global M two is roughly a hundred trillion. The dollar is about twenty trillion. So it represents twenty percent of global purchasing power. I think it will double. So as some of these currencies collapse, they collapse into the dollar. So by the end of the decade, year twenty thirty, I would expect the U S to have about forty percent U S dollar to have about forty percent of global purchasing power. So if the dollar is at a five hundred trillion dollar market cap and it represents forty percent of global M2, that means the global money supply is expanded to 1.25 quadrillion dollars. That is 1,250 trillion dollars, which is about 12x what it is today. So that sounds like the derivatives market to me, which is a completely BS market. But we'll come back when, you know, the people love numbers and all this. But one of the reasons uh, people want to listen to you right now is everybody wants to know. In 2031, what is your prediction for the price of Bitcoin? That is the only thing that people really care about right now. So they're going to make a decision whether they buy or not. Not on France, not on anything like this. But what does Robert Breed love to see? The future, given if history tracks, which it seems to be tracking, what will the price of Bitcoin be in 2031, which is 10 years? We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android and YouTube. And then please leave a review whenever you listen. All of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them because we don't, we're an education company. We make no recommendations. We're purely educational. Anything we say, take with a grain of salt. We don't recommend anything. And the most important thing is if you listen to this program again, you'll learn twice as much because repetition is how we learn. That's how you get become a better golfer. Repeat, keep, making, keep repeating. But also listen to this with friends, family, and business associates, especially those out there who are saving their stimulus check and hoping this will save them from what's coming down the road. Because our guest today is, is a friend of the Rich Dad Company, Rich Dad Radio, Robert Breedlove. And he's a founder and CEO and CIO of Parallax Digital. He's not only a CPA, but he's also an expert on this thing called Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And he's talking about what's going to happen in the next 10 years with the U.S. dollar, gold, silver, but most importantly, Bitcoin. So before we go on, you know, Robert, Robert was talking about something about which is beyond my head, but we had a good friend, his name is Philip Haslin. He's from South Africa. He wrote the book, the, um, how current, when currency destroys nations. And he was writing about the fall of Zimbabwe. And he's saying exactly the same thing. Robert Breedlove is saying, he calls it the seven falls. And the seven falls is once a country like Zimbabwe starts to print money, you take the first jump, and you can't go back up. Then you take the next jump, and there's four more falls to go, and you keep jumping. And so that's what Robert Breedlove's talking about in this program here, is America's already gone down that road. We, jump, <laughs> we take a big jump in 2021. This is March 2021, and we're going to keep jumping. <laughs> so, the, so the question is, Mr. Breedlove, what do, you, what do you see happening in the future? I mean, we, we have 20, 20, 2031 coming, and everybody was going to hold it to the last, but what do you think the future price of Bitcoin might be in 2031? But keep going into your analysis of why we have to keep jumping. Absolutely. Yeah, there's an old saying that says it's easier, it's harder to stop halfway downhill. <laughs> <laughs> not go initially. And I think that's what inflation yeah. is. Yeah. And this law that we mentioned, this law of accelerating issuance and depreciation related to currency, 
this is an ancient law. I mean, it's been written about for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is not uh, a joke. This is not something I made up. This is something you can find everywhere that this pattern repeats. Once countries start down this path, it's, uh, it's very bad and it's, and it's inescapable. You can't turn back. So going into 2031, which as we left off earlier, uh, I would expect the U.S. money supply to expand from 20 trillion ish today to about 500 trillion in the next 10 years. I expect global M2 to uh, expand roughly 12 X from around 100 trillion to about 1250 trillion, 1.25 quadrillion. Uh, and the difference there is that a lot of the weaker international currencies will have collapsed into the dollar. So the dollar will actually have grown in purchasing power overall. And I think by this time, so going into 2031, let's say, that Bitcoin will have continued its growth trajectory. It will have played out another one of these price cycles. Possibly uh, its price cycle will have broken and it just gone into a long, slow grind upwards as people realize it's a game of accumulation. And I think Bitcoin by this time will have reached about 20% of global purchasing power. So this would imply Bitcoin's market cap in 2031 dollars to be about $250 trillion. So that's about one fifth of global M2 stored in Bitcoin. Now, accounting for inflation, that means Bitcoin's market cap in today's dollars would be about 20 trillion. So in 2031 dollars, and this is a very bright line to distinguish, I think Bitcoin by the year 2031 will be north of $12.5 million per Bitcoin. Jesus. But twelve and a half million per coin? Twelve and a half million. But adjusting for inflation, it will only feel like north of one one million dollars per Bitcoin in twenty twenty one dollars. Because a dollar will have lost so much of its value by then. Twelve and a half million dollars will spin like one million dollars. So that's my prediction for by twenty thirty one. And then that's gonna clearly have some big impact on fiat currencies, including the dollar. Well, again, that goes back to Gresham's law is that the more fake money they, what, what you're talking about is when they, in, they increase M2 and M3 and all of those stuff they, they taught me in economics, which I forgot, mm. it's just printing more money. That's all they're doing. Right. And so that's what gives Bitcoin and the blockchain chain technology so much more credibility than the central bank money, fake money, I call it. That's right. Um, it's so as I've said in the past episode with you, actually, it's a pyramid scheme. Oh God. Yes. When we say printing money, you're not actually creating any new wealth or value. No. You're just shifting the claims on existing capital, dealing from those that are dependent on the dollar to hold its value, which are the poor, those living on fixed income, retirees, pensioners, you're stealing from the most economically vulnerable right. and giving to those with access uh, to the freshly printed money. Right. And look, this is why you know, my wife and I started the Rich Dad Companies. We need financial education. You know, just as simple as Gresham's Law, fake money drives out good money. You know what I mean? You have bad money. And our Federal Reserve Bank, the smartest guys on earth, you know, don't fight the Fed. They're printing trillions. Yeah. And, and we have millions of Americans and people all over the world waiting for the stimulus check. We're going to crush them. I mean, from, as from your financial background, in my opinion, every time we print money, we just create more poor people. I mean, that's poor what we're doing. Yeah. Well, well, what do you have to say about that? I mean, we're well, just creating poor people. You're 100% correct. And the fact that Jerome Powell can go on national television and say that there's no causation between monetary policy and wealth disparity is a testament to the times we're living in. I mean, we are drowning in deception in this world. It's just the whole world, the whole thing's built on lies. And I would argue, and I think many Bitcoiners would argue, it, all, it starts and ends with the money. We have a lie built into our money, right? The paper was once redeemable for gold. That became... Want to know where to... It pay violated pay? Gresham's law. We, we produced bad money. That's right. Throughout history, the Romans did it, Germans did it, Zimbabwe did it. Venezuela is doing it. Everybody's doing it. And now we have Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum. 
So that's why, that's why, you know, as an old guy, I've got to keep my mind open and I got to defend the old guy like Peter Schiff <laughs> who keeps going back and forth. I'm going to just buy some stupid Bitcoin, Peter. Why argue? <laughs> yeah, it's when we corrupt and violate the trust fabric that right. connects us, which is money, society unravels. And that is, you know, we have lots of anecdotal evidence of that throughout history. Every time the currency collapses, the civilization collapses. So, and, you know, I would argue that it's, you know, clearly I'm very focused on Bitcoin. I'm not, I don't advocate for other cryptocurrencies. I don't think Ethereum is going to be a big deal um, or as big of a deal as, as Bitcoin. I think gold is a 5,000 year old technology will only be disrupted once. And that is by Bitcoin. And that's what we're going to see play out over the next 10 years. So with Bitcoin by 2031, north of $12.5 million per coin, it's equal to about 20% of the global purchasing power. So it's about half the dollar's value in total. But again, the dollar will have increased according to the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation. Its issuance rate will have increased, I'm predicting, to north of 145% by the early 2030s. This would be early stage hyperinflation. Uh, or you could say actually probably medium stage hyperinflation. Typically a currency won't last more than a few years um, under that, that well, growth. This, this is the infamous Weimar Republic, which led yeah. to the rise of Adolf Hitler. That's right. Every dictator, every internment camp, every world war in human history was funded by fiat currency. Right. Because those individuals were not limited to the bounds of their own balance sheet. They could use fiat currency to steal the savings from the entire society and just keep going to war until everyone's broke. That's like the story of my mother. She'd always say, how can I be broke? I still have checks. <laughs> so, so, let me, so let me take the old guy side, okay? So I'm going I'm to challenge you on this side. So as an old guy, I was just in uh, Park City the other day. Again, you know, this is March 2021 because the day everything's changing so quickly. Um, these guys came up to me and they were telling me about the new altcoins or something they're producing. And you know, when I talk to guys like you, they say, "Well, Bitcoin is the network." Well, just being an old guy, you know, the network is like McDonald's. What gives McDonald's power? Is there a franchise network? But there was also a blockbuster video that digital blew out of the water. You know, why, why would you go to blockbuster where you can download digitally? So when these young guys were coming up to me saying, oh, Bitcoin is trash because they're going to start another currency. So being an old guy, how would you explain to me that idea? Because it's coming out of your head. It's not coming out of a gold mine or a silver mine. But by the way, Park City was a silver mine. So, how couldn't somebody just create their own Bitcoin and their own network and just blow Bitcoin out of the water? So, this is a nuanced answer to the question. Um, it's not a straightforward question to answer because many people think, oh, iPhone disrupted BlackBerry, Facebook disrupted MySpace, something can disrupt Bitcoin. Uh, the first answer would be money itself. Why is money as a network valued? And it turns out that there are properties to money, divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity. And then the network that gets built up around that is valued based on how liquid it is uh, and, and what the network effects are. So how many people you can exchange with. This is uh, so, so let me give you the old guy's story. Okay, that's like McDonald's. I can go into McDonald's here in Beijing and I can get a Big Mac. And it tastes about the same. The French fries are about the same. That's the network or the, the effect. That's, that's what gives McDonald's its power. Yeah, I would say, I would modify it slightly and say, again, gold's a good analogy here. It's like, if I have a lot of gold, I know I can buy it or sell it on the market with least loss in price. So right. it has a lot of saleability, a lot of marketability. It's, li it's liquid. People, there's demand all over the world for it. So... New investors always prefer the most liquid money. Right. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, basically. It's the, the same reason, the argument I commonly make is the same quantifiable reasons we only have one analog gold 
we will only, for those same reasons, we will only have one digital gold. And then again, if you look at those properties of money that gold best satisfied historically, divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity, Bitcoin has essentially perfected them. It's a pure digital asset, so it's infinitely divisible. It's stored in a distributed way, so the information does not break down. This is something like the Bible, right? The Bible's outlasted empires because it's distributed information. It's infinitely portable because it's digital. You can move it at the speed of light. Uh, it's infinitely recognizable, meaning you can audit the total supply. You can run a node. You can verify the money supply. Anyone can do it anywhere for free. And then finally, it has perfect scarcity. Um, it's the first asset in human history that we know has an absolutely fixed supply and no one can change. Okay. And family, before I even get going, I know you guys heard what he said. Liquidity. Liquidity is the key. And that's what GOPX is all about. Liquidity. You hear Alex Slocum talking about liquidity. Liquidity. I'm telling you guys right now, this is the first blockchain currency and it's going to go high. I'm going to be honest with you. My opinion, my this is from my opinion. I believe GOPX can touch $150,000. That's just my opinion. Than Bitcoin. Yeah. So being an old guy, I had no retort. I couldn't come back at him because I don't really know. So why couldn't somebody just create their own coins? I mean, so, aren't, aren't they going to? And they do. There's thousands of them out there. Um, because if you're trying to compete with Bitcoin directly as money, and it has perfected those five properties of money, there's essentially no design space left to introduce a feature that could disrupt Bitcoin. And if there was, so first of all, wow, you're saying it all Satoshi or whoever he was locked it up tight. Well, digit, you know, once you digitize money, money's an informational instrument. It gains all of these advantages and right. the, the services it offers become, um, you know, as good as we can create. With, with so are you saying it, it automatically gets stronger? Well, here's the thing. Assuming even if these guys are, the next Einstein and they figured out something else that money needs that none of us knew it needed. Should they go into the market? They sell this coin. It starts to have some success. Bitcoin is still adaptive. It's open source technology. So if there's a feature they've developed that makes money better, which we don't know of one again, Bitcoin can absorb that feature set. It's open source technology. It can still, it resists harmful changes, but it, it can uh, absorb useful changes, let's say. So this further insulates it. So it's adaptable, it's flexible, it'll change. It's a living money, right? Bitcoin too, the difficulty adjustment itself, the harder we try to mine Bitcoin, it actually adapts, it responds to human action and becomes more difficult to produce over time. That is the game. Is it's, um, it's the first money that's responsive to human action. Okay, being an old guy again, all right? So way back when, when um, the dot-com era came up, there was pets.com and there was Amazon. And again, an old guy like me didn't know the difference between pets.com and Amazon. So I invested in neither of them. So are you saying that Amazon just got more adaptive and stronger and blew pets.com out of the water? He, this is actually leads to another good point is that network effects themselves. So a network effect, first of all, is a network becomes exponentially more valuable. Each new network participant then joins. So uh, one guy joins, but it becomes one to the power of whatever more valuable. So it's becoming exponentially more valuable per new participant. Network effects can have multiple sides too. So when we saw Facebook disrupt MySpace. They did that by introducing a superior value prop to just the user. Facebook and MySpace is a one-sided network effect. If you look at something like Craigslist, this is a two-sided market. They have buyers and sellers in the marketplace. So they are more protected from disruption because to disrupt Craigslist, you need to introduce a better value prop for buyers and sellers simultaneously. Okay. Otherwise, nobody moves, right? And you can see this in Craigslist. It's kind of, it doesn't have a lot of innovation, but because of its early lead, it's still a fairly well-established network. 